Hey there, and welcome to my tutorial about how to draw soap bubbles and foam. Soap bubbles have fascinating color patterns and come in many different shapes. In this video I will go into great detail to explain not only how to draw them, but also give you a basic understanding of why they look the way they do. So without further ado, let's start drawing. Thank you. At first I will show you real quick how to draw some bubble textures, shapes and highlights in different styles. I won't completely finish these drawings, but just give you examples, and later I will switch to a couple of prepared drawings. This way I can show you more different versions, at a much better quality. Alright, so in order to draw a bubble and nicely show all of the vibrant colors, choose a dark background. The same would also go for taking photos of them. Of course you can also draw them on a bright background, but then the bubble would be much fainter. My color palette has very bright and strongly saturated rainbow colors. Of course, which colors you use is completely up to you. Of course, we're starting with the outlining. And I'm giving the outlining a bit of line weight to emphasize where the light is coming from. So here, on these sides here, the lines are a bit thicker. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle, like here by using a ruler, but also can have some kind of wobbly shape. Then I very lightly sketch in some shapes, they can't be symmetrical, or not, it is completely up to you. Their shapes can be more angular, or rounder, and I'm leaving one side open, because I'm going to draw a color gradient into the shape that follows the same curvature. And so at the end I'm planning on letting this color gradient fade out. So I just simply pick out the first color, and fill in the side where we start at and make sure that it is filled in real nicely so we have this kind of solid color and then switch directions and just draw everything in this kind of zigzag motion this real quick one and fill everything out and make sure that this line here is going to disappear so I apply enough color so we don't see it anymore And then we pick the next color, and we can go either direction, it doesn't matter. And then draw it right on top of the previous color. Not next to it, but right on top of it, because we want to have no gaps and a nice gradient between the colors. Also go ahead and rotate the canvas. It makes it much easier for you if you just use your natural movement of the wrist. And then, at the end, you just simply do this kind of hatching motion to establish a better gradient towards the previous color. This is also a nice texture. And then, you probably have guessed it already, you pick the next color and fill everything in. And you do that until you have filled out the whole shape. And then when you arrived at the end, you again want to establish a gradient, so you do this hatching motion, but this time into the dark background. So we have some kind of fade out effect right at the end. And that's basically it. You just combine a couple of hatching lines over each other. And there we go. In order to make some corrections, you can just simply use a blending tool. Or, if you're using traditional media, just use your finger for example, or some kind of tissue, and blend some of the colors together. You don't want to overdo it, because we still want to keep the texture. Well, if you want to keep it, that is. It's still completely up to you how much you're going to blend. And you do that with all of these shapes, you just fill them out with whatever colors you want and establish some really nice looking gradients. But that alone is not enough of course, so what I like to do is to give these shapes some white outlining to indicate that there are some kind of highlights around them. Also, I'm going to bloat up this corner here in particular so it looks like a really big highlight is sitting right here. These outlines don't have to be uniform, they can have a varying line weight, however you see fit. And also they don't exactly have to follow those shapes, they can even overreach. It is completely fine, it's completely up to you 
how you want to draw them. To make this corner even extra bright and shiny looking, you can once again draw with the same kind of motion from before some white into these colors here and establish a gradient once again with this hatching motion and this way this corner looks extra bright. You can do the same for some other spots in these shades. Completely up to you. Whatever you want to see a bit brighter. And as the last extra touch, we are going to add some kind of lens flare effect to this corner. So you draw these lines that are quite thick right here in the middle and then fade out. They get thinner and fainter. And then what you can do in order to make them fade out is to draw these lines and dots. I normally draw these horizontal lines extra wide. And then we have some spikes and lines pointing into other random directions. How many you have of them is completely up to you, of course. Once again, we also have these kind of small dots and lines to make them fade out. And they're normally shorter than this main lens flare over here. And there we go. Looks really shiny and bright now. So you would do that for all of these shapes, fill them out with colors and add some highlights to the shapes, but your colors don't have to be limited to these shapes that you drew before, but you can just drop in some colors here and there, however you see fit. Also establish some kind of gradients. It's totally fine. Let these lines follow whatever direction you want. You can also do that with white. Maybe make these kind of borders a bit brighter, or you just drop it right into the middle. It's completely up to you. The shape can also be however you want them to be. So you can have some really long lines, or you draw something more small and compact. And then when you have filled out everything with the colors and gradients that you want, you add in some extra sparkly highlights here and there, wherever you want them to be. And also they can have, once again, all sorts of different shapes. It's completely up to you. You can have, once again, more angular shapes, or rounder shapes, they can be symmetrical, or just completely wild and chaotic. Once again, it's completely up to you. It can also be quite large, or you just add in a bunch of really tiny dots all over the place. Some of these highlights can also have some of these lens flare effects, maybe just horizontal, or they can have some additional sparks. It's completely up to you. I want to give you one more example. The previous one was with some kind of more pencil-like brush. Now this time, we have a more solid and smudgy brush. Again, you can sketch out the shapes that you want to have. This time I'm not going to fill out everything with shapes because, you know, you get the idea. And then you choose your first color and paint right in. I do not care about making it look very clean. I just need to apply the color that I want to have. And in the later steps, we will make it more cleaner looking. It looks very sloppy now. So for the next step, I want to mix those colors together. We have some kind of smudge tool again, and I'm just doing this zigzag motion between these blocks of colors, so they blend in together. I also do this here at this end to establish a fade out effect, or at least do the first step for it, because right now it looks very sloppy very unclean, but that's okay, because there is going to be another step. So next up we're still blending, but this time in a circular motion. And this way, it gains this kind of painterly, cloudy texture, that in my opinion looks quite nice. And we do this for the whole thing. And also, go ahead and just pull some of the color into the other blocks of colors, like maybe here, this yellow into, into the orange, or some of this magenta into this pink. It's completely up to you how you want to form it, but this way, you give it more of a unique shape. 
It's not perfect, it's not uniform, but has a bit of a more of a natural feel to it, if that makes sense. And there we go, we have our block of color in a nice texture. And next up, once again, you can outline everything with white and keep it like before. It's not all that different. You can once again have a corner that is going to be very bright. You can paint some of this white into the color once again and then smudge everything together in a similar circular motion to have a bright looking corner. With the smudge tool you can make some adjustments to these lines here too. And also, once again, we can give this corner some kind of lens flare effect. This time, it is going to look a bit more smudgy. So, you kind of stretch out this white further and further. You can also use some kind of blend tool in order to stretch it out even further. And as the last extra touch, what you can do is Use a very, very light tool, like an airbrush tool, and just paint in some white around the highlight. Just very, very lightly and with a wide radius, so it looks quite shiny. And you just can drop in some of this white here and there too, to make some spots brighter. And you can do the same to, for example, those outlines, to make them also look shinier. Or, if you have some highlights here and there, and you can do the same. And that's a neat little trick to make everything of the bubble look extra shiny. There are many different ways to draw simple and stylized bubbles. You can be very creative with them. To give you more examples, here are a bunch of bubbles in different styles. For some of them I used the same techniques like those I just showed you. Like here we have this pencil texture and below are some painterly looking ones. Instead of cramming these colors into these shapes, you could also paint them kind of as clouds. So here we have two examples. One has very faint colors, and the other one is really strongly saturated. To establish a texture like that, you use circular motions, similar to how I just showed you. Another way would be to draw the bubble with some finely drawn details and reflections. This example here in particular stands out quite a lot, because of these mirrored images. So the examples I've shown you so far were fairly stylized. Now I want to explain to you how to draw more realistic soap bubbles. Here is another example of a bubble, but this time with more details. You can see the little mink taking a photo of this bubble, and the picture shows two reflections of it, with one being flipped around. This is the picture I made before I transformed it into the bubble. Pretty simple and cartoony, it just needed to get the point across. So three things have been changed about this image. First of all, it is very transparent, a soap bubble isn't the best reflector. Secondly, the image got distorted. The bubble is a three-dimensional shape, in this case a sphere. If you project an image onto a sphere, it will bend towards the edges. A sphere is also not a very precise kind of lens, therefore the edges get blurry. And last but not least, the image exists twice, with one of them inverted. The two sides fade into each other along the horizontal center line. To give you a better understanding as to why that is the case, I made a little simulation on a super useful website. Alright, at first glance that might look confusing, but the setup is very simple. By the way, these explanations about the science behind soap bubbles aren't essential for drawing them. If you are only interested in the drawing parts of this video, you can skip some sections by using the timestamps. However, I personally think that it's still interesting to know, and understanding how the things you draw work can be useful in certain occasions. So I have a point light source that sends out light rays in all directions. In this simulation I can control how many light rays it produces. And on the other side there is a half circle, which is supposed to represent a profile of the back side of a bubble. Why only the back side? Because I have the front side down here, and we need to look at them separately. So this simulation can calculate how the light rays are reflected off these shapes, which here act as mirrors. So what you can see here at these two spots, the light rays in yellow and extended rays in orange are focusing. So at these focal points, we would see a real image and a virtual image. 
What does that mean? Let's say we have an arrow and the tip is our light source. The images are projections of this object. So basically what the camera is able to focus on and see sharply. And so we have two images of our arrow, one pointing up and one pointing down. It is thanks to the bubble's transparency that we are able to see both of these images at the same time. Back to our drawing here. Now I hope this makes more sense now. If you look very closely at the real soap bubble, you can see this effect too. By the way, the highlights are symmetrical because of that same reason. Alright, another thing, which seems very trivial, is the bubble's spherical shape. The fact that a bubble forms a sphere is pretty obvious to us. It's common sense. But why is that the case? Well, it has to do with something called surface tension. To explain this, I need to explain what cohesion is. It is simply a force between molecules of the same kind, which pulls them together. A soap bubble is mostly made of soap and water molecules. Right now, let's only look at water molecules. So we have a body of water with a surface. In the middle of this body, the molecules experience an attractive force from the other molecules around. Because these forces are coming equally from all directions at the same time, the forces cancel each other out. The net force is zero. However, those molecules that sit at the surface only experience forces inwards, towards the body of water. So the net force is non-zero. However, these molecules want to stay in a state of balance, in a state of minimal energy. So, in order to minimize the amount of molecules on the surface, which are in this undesired energy state, the surface area has to be minimized. And a sphere is simply the three-dimensional shape that has the lowest surface area for a certain volume. So that is surface tension. It's a resistance against increasing the surface area. Our soap bubble is constructed differently though. At first, let's have a look at the soap molecule. The only thing we need to know is that they have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. Hydrophilic means that it is attracted to water. Hydrophobic means that it repulses water. And here is a simplified illustration of how a soap bubble is constructed. The soap molecules arrange themselves so that they build these inner and outer walls, trapping the water in between. The heads of the soap molecules are pointing towards the water. And of course, the soap molecules themselves want to retain a minimal surface area. Therefore, they take on this spherical shape. Back to our drawing here. There's one more thing I would like to explain before I move on to the next drawing. I know, it's a lot of information and physics right from the beginning. But please be patient. All of these basics will give you a better understanding how this and the later bubbles work. So, you probably also noticed this already. In addition to the colors of the reflected image, there is this colorful warping pattern. What is up with that? At first, let me show you how it looks in real life. Here you can see a large bubble sitting on this little piece of plastic that is covered in a soapy solution so that the bubble doesn't burst immediately. It has been filmed in a darkened tent. The only other significant objects inside the tent are the camera and another light source at the side. I wanted to create a very dark environment with a black background so that the bubble's color pattern can be seen clearly. This bubble has been freshly blown, so the surface is still whirling around. But then the colors start to settle and create this kind of rainbow pattern. So we have some very complex looking patterns and lots of colors. But why? Well, once again, it's all about physics. In particular, it has to do with so-called thin film physics. So this here is supposed to be our soap bubble wall. Its exact molecular structure doesn't matter all that much right now. And then we have a light ray coming in. All light rays have a specific wavelength. The colors that we see are simply light rays with different wavelengths. It hits the surface of this membrane and part of it gets reflected. Both angles are the same. And another part of this ray goes through this thin film, but this time at a different angle. That is because the materials of this membrane, which is mostly water and soap, and whatever is around it, air for example, are different materials. They have different refraction indices. You could say that the light ray wants to travel through the membrane in a shorter amount of time, because it gets slowed down in it. The soap water solution is denser than the air. Therefore, the light ray chooses a shorter path. As it hits the opposite surface, part of it travels through again. Its angle reverts to how it was before. But another part of it gets reflected again. It travels back up, hits the top surface, and gets refracted back so that the angle is now parallel to this ray now. 
However, the waves of these two rays are shifted. If you look at these spots, you can see that they are not aligned with the opposite wave. That shift depends on how thick the membrane is, so in other words, how long this travel path is. Now because this film is so thin, these rays are very close to each other, and talking in a scale of a few hundred nanometers here. And that closeness causes them to interfere with each other. Both of these waves are basically combining, and because of the shift, the result is a different wave than before, a different color. Look at this graph that shows you the color reflections of a soap bubble depending on the film thickness. You basically go through all the colors over and over until it fades out because the film is too thick for the light rays to interfere with each other. Another interesting thing is also what happens when the film gets ultra thin. As you can see, the light mostly stays white, and then the film gets so thin that it basically is just transparent, shown here as black. Let's take another look at our bubble now that we know these things. You can see the same color gradient like in the graph because gravity is pulling the soap solution downwards. The bottom of the bubble gets progressively thicker while the top is thinning out. During the last moments before it bursts, the top part is so thin that it's basically just transparent. That is also the reason why it pops in the end. In a zero gravity environment, it would last much longer. Alright, so you still might ask why these complex warping shapes are forming. Here is a photo as an even clearer example, not shot by me. So what happens is that films of different thicknesses don't completely mix together. They instead flow around and next to each other. It's a very complex and chaotic dance of colors. Something simple math couldn't describe, but instead you'd need extensive computer simulations. Here are some drawings I made as examples. Even though at first glance it looks just completely abstract, there are actually some rules to follow to achieve these patterns. First of all, there are no sharp edges. Everything flows, everything is round. Then also try to think with drops, rivers and whirls. For example, we have this blue drop flowing into the yellow-orange sea, also making it form a drop shape. Inside the drop there are often also smaller shapes which follow the same flow. You can also add in tiny spots here and there. They can be a different color than the river they sit in, or just transparent, illustrated here as black. I personally find these black spots especially fascinating. They have a tendency of grouping together and forming large holes. These larger shapes have most of the time kind of a striped pattern. When you encounter a freeway intersection, like here, again, keep in mind that no sharp corners are allowed. Rivers can fade out, but normally do so in a very stretched out way. They are typical groups of colors. Purple and blue are often next to each other, as are yellow and orange. Most of the time there is barely any red or green. That has to do with the color spectrum we saw before. As you can see here at the thinner side, there is basically no green or purple, and the larger thicknesses have no reds. I also went ahead and analyzed a couple of photographs of soap bubble surfaces just like the one from before. So these graphs show all the colors of certain pictures, where the angle indicates the hue, and the distance from the center represents the saturation. The dots are also colored accordingly. And then the density and size of the dots show how strongly certain colors were shown in the picture. And so if we take a closer look, you can see these bumps and gaps right where we have red and green. The pictures are very different from each other. They use different cameras, might have used some filters during photo editing, and the surfaces could have been overall thicker or thinner. But still, pretty much across all of them, you are able to notice these bumps. So, if you want to use colors that are more realistic, then maybe avoid using too much red and green. Using all of these techniques and basics, you can be creative and draw shapes in a somewhat recognizable way. This is supposed to be Psycho Fox's character. He wanted me to draw that soap bubble surface texture for a song that he thought of while watching me paint those kind of patterns during a livestream. And so I thought, why not make it more interesting and include his Fox character here. I also recorded the drawing process to show you how I made it. At first I quickly painted the rough shapes and determined the general flow of the colors. And then I added smaller details and smoothened some edges. I do have to say though, that this painting process is incredibly time consuming, especially if you make a large picture like this one. Of course there are also different ways to paint this kind of pattern. Some might require more time and some less. It also strongly depends on the tools you're using. 
Since we're already talking about the color patterns, let me move on to the next drawing, which is also a good example. So here we have several bubbles sticking together, creating this very unique shape. I completely overdid it with the color pattern, it took me forever. But at least it also serves now as a nice extra example for how the color patterns could be painted. I gotta say, this texture looks kind of mesmerizing, and painting something like this can feel quite relaxing. Alright, so now let's talk about the shape of this bubble cluster. I talked about the soap water membrane trying to always form a sphere to minimize its surface area. Now if you have two of these three-dimensional shapes joined together and intersecting each other, then that intersection will be two-dimensional. The smallest surface area between two spheres will then be a circle, as you can see here in this picture when you look at the largest bubbles. Just make sure you get the perspective right. A thing to consider, however, is that when two bubbles join together like that, both of them won't form two half spheres, but a little bit more than that. And then, if you have three or more bubbles intersecting, then the intersection between all of them is reduced to one dimension, a line. Most of the time, a straight line. You can go ahead and add as many smaller and larger bubbles as you want. Just keep in mind that as you add more, geometrically, it will get more complex and confusing. The smaller bubbles tend to settle in the corners between larger ones. You can see that I didn't include a reflected image in this case, it would just be way too complex to draw something like that accurately. As for the light reflections, you can roughly repeat the same kind of highlight pattern on each bubble. Not exactly the same, but roughly. Also keep in mind that these bubbles are still mostly transparent. You can still see through them, and therefore also see the bubbles at the back. These flat intersections can also look quite shiny. It is a good idea to only make those flat areas brighter that have the same angle relative to the light source and not all of them. This makes it even easier for the viewer to distinguish the individual bubbles. While I was filming some bubbles, I also recorded some footage of intersecting bubbles. They are not freely floating, but sitting on the sheet of plastic covered in soap solution. Nevertheless, this is still good for demonstration purposes. Pay attention to how the intersection areas and lines are shaped. Another thing that this footage is showing very nicely is the color gradient on the flat intersection area. Yes, those have color patterns too. It's also rather swirly and chaotic before it settles into an even stripe pattern. I have to say, it is kind of fascinating to me to look at these videos. And let me tell you, every time I managed to blow some bubbles that lasted a long time, I felt really excited. Okay then, next up a drawing of a wobbly bubble. A large bubble can have quite an irregular shape shortly after it has been created. It takes some time to balance out the surface and form a close to perfect sphere. These shapes are rather complex, but actually not that complicated to paint. There are a couple of rules that you can follow. First of all, avoid any kind of sharp edges, make it round and smooth. To establish the general shape, at first you do the outlining, and then paint in some lighter areas. A good way to form the shape is to paint in the ridges, those corners in between bulges. You can make the edges especially bright and the center of the bulges stays mostly dark. Don't feel bad if it doesn't look right straight away, it sometimes takes a few tries and corrections. As with many things, practice and experience enables you to draw better and more consistently. As always, I added a color pattern to it, not as detailed as the previous drawing though. This color pattern can actually help you further emphasize the shape of this bubble, although it is a bit challenging to distort it following the warpiness of the bubble. And then add in a bunch of highlights. Symmetry in this case doesn't really matter, just make sure to distribute highlights across the whole bubble. You can even let them roughly follow the shape of the bubble. Well, unfortunately these soap bubbles are very fragile and normally don't last all that long, especially the large ones. So when you come in contact with an object that is not covered in soap or water, or enough time passes and gravity thins out the top too much, then it is time for the bubble to say farewell and burst into thousands of tiny droplets. Unfortunately, I do not have a good enough camera for capturing that moment in high detail, but I can draw it. The way these bubbles pop is also quite fascinating. They don't burst all at once, but they start from a singular spot, and then a chain reaction spreads over the whole surface in a matter of milliseconds. This bursting process even has some symmetry to it. You can often see some kind of wave pattern. You can also see that right at the edge of the remaining bubble. It is not even, but has a wavy shape. Of course, it is not perfectly symmetrical. It is still mostly chaotic. 
So when you draw something like this, follow the original shape of the bubble. At the sides you draw more tiny droplets than at the center. That is simply because of perspective. The droplets are flying away from the bubble. It is an explosion. Vary the size of the droplets. Don't make them too large though. However, they can become extremely small. And then go ahead and add a pattern to the tiny droplets. An easy way is to actually start with the remaining bubble and its border. Right where you drew the peaks of this wave pattern, you imagine some lines drawn across the sphere converging towards the initial point where the chain reaction started. However, if a very wobbly bubble is bursting, there is mostly no visible symmetry because the initial shape wasn't symmetrical to begin with. A nice little extra touch is to make the back part of the bubble blurry. It adds more three-dimensionality. By the way, you can tell that these bubbles most likely popped because of some object and not because they ran out of time. They didn't burst from the top. And also, the color pattern is not parallel to the burst edge. Alright, as the last part of this tutorial, I'm going to talk about foam. It's basically tons of tiny bubbles sticking together. However, drawing all of them in detail, like the ones before, would be ridiculous. Instead, you simplify them. Here, in this case, I just drew them as little circles. How much you cut off the circle depends on the view angle. If you look at the foam from above, you draw them as complete circles. Or you paint them some white at first and cut out some tiny circles. And these bubbles here swim on top of some kind of liquid, most likely water. Therefore, the shape they take is a bit less than half a sphere. When you look at the foam from the side, then that fact will become more visible. So drawing foam is mostly just drawing a simple pattern of circles or overlapping curves at varying sizes. Often the bubbles towards the edges of the cluster get progressively smaller and the large ones are more at the center. That is not always the case though. The small bubbles have no extra detail, but the large ones at least have some simple highlights. To add to the three-dimensionality, keep in mind the large bubbles form gaps inside the bubble clusters. You can see through them, so you can see that circular gap. Keep the perspective in mind though. Draw some small bubbles around that gap. And sometimes several large bubbles are sticking together. At this point you know how the geometry would work. A couple of smaller bubbles can also stack up next to these large bubbles. At the edge of the cluster you normally have only one layer of bubbles, but towards the center the density typically increases. The more bubbles are stacked above each other, the less transparent it becomes, until you basically just see white with maybe a faint texture. If you have a medium-sized bubble, you can draw a small bubble pattern inside it to indicate that there are more bubbles underneath it. Other than that, you can just broadly paint in some faint white over the areas that are supposed to be denser. And that's basically it. It's really not that complicated. It just requires some patience since it's quite repetitive. By the way, these bubbles don't have to be made of a soap solution. It's just that soap bubbles last longer. Before I started doing the research for this tutorial, I thought that it's going to be a rather short one. I was so wrong. It's crazy how much you can talk about so seemingly simple like bubbles. Originally I wanted to combine this video with underwater bubbles, but as I wrote the script and the pages started piling up, I knew that I had to make separate videos for them. Well, even after all these years of making tutorials, I still suck at estimating how much time and effort it is going to take me to prepare one about a new topic. So that's it for this video. If you want to see more, I have plenty of other tutorials, and this video in particular has been part of a series about water. I already made tutorials about water drops and underwater bubbles, and others about waves, splashes, of waterfalls, rivers, clouds, and so on will follow. So subscribe and turn on the notifications so you won't miss them. Well, you know, all that self-promotion stuff. Thank you a lot for watching. If you have any questions or constructive feedback, then please leave a comment down below. And for more information and links, please check out the description of this video. There is quite a lot in there. Alright then, have fun trying. Thank you.